praise God, praise God, amen, good afternoon or good evening, whichever one you uh, choose to use at this particular moment, amen, praise God. We are here together, here worshiping God, here depending on God, here trusting and believing God to, to do a wonderful, awesome thing in our midst. We're trusting God to open up the windows of heaven and pour us out blessings that we cannot contain. We're trusting God to uh, show us uh, and reveal to us his uh, amen, his uh, will and his way and what and his plan for us so that as we go out to serve as disciples, as we go out to uh, lead his people back to him, we're able to effectively serve. We're able to do it effectively, efficiently, and efficaciously. Amen. Amen. Praise God. We are uh, excited to be here this afternoon. Amen. Trying to get all the electronic stuff working here right quick so we can go ahead and jump into that which we are, we are going to do tonight. Amen. I trust and believe that you've had a good day. I trust and believe Believe, uh, that you are uh, experiencing uh, the fullness of God's grace and mercy and as such I believe that we uh, are going to have a great Bible study amen amen um, so let's do this let's open up um, uh, uh, let's open up with an opening word of prayer. Amen. And then we'll follow that up with our question and answer session if we have any. I don't know if there's anyone that has any questions right now. Uh, uh, and then after that, we'll get into our lesson uh, tonight. All right? Thank you. So let's open up with a word of prayer. Amen. Dear Father God, creator of the heavens and the earth, God, we come to you right now praying and asking God that you will be a very, very present help in this moment, God. We're coming to you, asking you to be a blessing to us. We're coming to you, asking that you would speak to us where we are and that you would help us understand what it means to walk by faith, to talk by faith, and to serve by faith. That we are asking you that you would help empower us and help us, God, to bring you to the people that need you so that, God, they may turn to you and they may trust you and depend on you at all times, all places, and all ways. Father God, it is always a blessing when we experience you in our lives. It's always a blessing when we uh, get to know you uh, and, and cherish you. And Father God, we pray right now that God, you'll let us know you fully, know you completely, know you intimately. So that God, when we step out, we step out in such a way that we bring you glory, that we bring you honor, that we bring you uh, uh, praise. Father God, we pray for those who uh, are not uh, are not able to join us tonight, but want to. We, we thank you for those who will join us. Amen. And God, we praise your name for those people that you're sending our way to become a part of this fellowship, become a part of the body of Christ here at First Fellowship Charlotte. God, we ask that you would pour out onto us tonight and pour out to us, God, so that we may tackle the challenges, the tasks, and the obligations of discipleship and stewardship that you place before us. We love you, God, and we thank you. It's in your son's mighty, matchless, marvelous, and magnificent name that we do pray. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Hold on one second. I'm at home and the noise, I don't want the noise to come in. All right. Amen. I'm sorry. I apologize with, you know, being home here now. Uh, amen. Uh, we, we are we are here at the house doing Bible said we normally would be at church. And while we're at church, we don't have the competing nature of 
uh, family doing other things but here at home we have that so you know there's so much noise coming from the neighboring room that I need to get up and ask them to turn it down but we're praying we're hoping and praying uh, that that would not be a distraction for us here tonight amen so let's get started amen let's pick up where we left off last week in our Bible study amen praise God when we last got together and we last met we were talking about how when God came to the garden, amen, he's coming to the garden to spend time with the man and woman. We know the man and woman are Adam and Eve. They just haven't received that those names yet. They Adam and Eve don't get their names until... Uh, uh, until uh, they're punished, really until they're kicked out the garden. Before them, they're just man and woman. So we're dealing with that right now until we get to that part of the second creation story where they actually kicked out the garden. Uh, but God has come to the garden to spend some time with the man and the woman. And what happens when he comes to the garden, he comes to where they normally uh, spend time together and he cannot find them. And so God asks the question, where are you? And not only does he ask the question, where are you, when the man responds to God where he is and why he's not where he's supposed to be, God then asks him, asks him why are you naked? Who, why, how do you know you're naked? Who told you? And have you eaten from the fruit that I forbade you to eat? Uh, we, we talked about that the authors of this story are the Yahweh's group of Jewish authors, all right? And for the Yahweh's group of Jewish authors, it's not important for God to be omniscient. Him not knowing everything does not distinguish or diminish him being God at all. In fact, the authors of the second creation story have written the creation story so that God is not always present. That God is away in heaven while the man and woman are down here on earth, amen, uh, down here on earth, caring for the garden. And so in his absence, he's unaware that the serpent has manipulated, has tricked and twisted um, the woman and the man to consume fruit uh, from, the gar from, from the forbidden tree. Good evening, uh, Sister Phyllis. We see you. Amen. Praise God. Um, the serpent has tricked uh, the man and the woman into uh, eating the uh, forbidden fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Amen. So he doesn't know that. And so when he comes to the garden, he's leisurely strolling through the garden. They hear him coming through the garden. They hide themselves. And God calls out, where are you? And they say, and we're hiding. So that's an indication God doesn't know where they are. Now, I know someone's going to get upset because we've been taught all our life that the God we serve is omnipotent, all-powerful, omniscient, all-knowing, omnipresent, uh, forever present, or always present. I've even taught you that God is omniferous, a fourth quality, that he's all things to all people at all times without diminishing who he is in any, in any quantitative or qualitative way while he's being all things to all people. All right. But to the authors of this second creation story, he's not om omniscient and he's not omnipresent. Uh, he's omnipotent, though. A amen. And so he doesn't know where they are. And then once he realizes that they're hiding, he doesn't know why they're hiding. Amen. Praise God. Uh, and But again, for the Yahweh, that's not important. What's important for the for the Yahweh is that God knew God is a God that, of choices. Amen that there is a set of choices for every situation that we deal with. And these authors believed that God not only knew what every choice was for every, uh, every situation we encountered, every circumstance we experienced, but he made those choices available to us. All right, amen. Now here's the thing about what the Yahweh's, how they operate and how they Thought. The Yahweh's did not believe that God forced you into choosing any particular choice. In fact, the Yahweh's would probably be forebearers to the Christian theologians called free choice theology, theologians or free choice theology. This is the whole idea that God doesn't make the decisions for us. He puts the decision be before us. Amen. 
He doesn't make decisions for us. He just sets the decisions in front of us, the choices in front of us, and then he lets us make the decision that we make. Now, sometimes we choose right and correctly and we make the right decision, and therefore he then rewards us. But there are other times when we make the wrong decision and then he has to punish us. That's the whole basis of free choice theology. The opposite of free choice theology is what we like to claim predestined theology, where God has created everything. He's created a plan for everything to happen, and he's orchestrated things that happen that happen so that nothing that we do is a surprise to God because everything we're doing, we're doing it uh, the way God wanted it to happen. In fact, let me give you an example of these two theologies, amen, that we see them and experience them all the time. Go to a few Funeral, any funeral and the first thing you will hear the preacher say to the family who's mourning the loss of a loved one is that God knew that this day was coming amen that God appointed this time for this person to be called home to the Lord that's predestination y'all in other words, God knew this ahead of time, so we don't have to be upset. We don't have to be uh, bent out of shape because God knew that he was going to call our loved ones home. That's predestination. Come back to church 12, 24 hours later, the same preacher is getting up saying, you have a choice to either choose God or don't choose God. You have a choice to choose salvation or don't choose salvation. Now we're back on free choice. Now the, 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 the minister is or the preacher is saying that God has put the the option before us of which which choice to choose. Either we choose salvation or we don't. Either we choose to serve God or we don't. The uh, I'm sorry. The uh, Yahwehs who wrote the second creation story contained in Genesis chapter two and three are more free choice theologians than anything else, and so. In their mind, it's not necessary that God know everything. It's not necessary that God uh, uh, is always present. It's always, but it's always necessary that God is aware of all the choices for any given situation and that he makes those choices available to us. Amen. Uh, a amen. Um, with that said, uh, once we've made the choice again, if we chose correctly, he blesses us. If we choose wrongly, he punishes us. There's repercussions. Amen. Amen. Um, in this, so where that has brought us for tonight is that in this scenario, what, where God, the man and the woman, and the serpent currently are, there's several things that God was not aware of. Okay, amen. He was not aware of where the man and woman were physically. He's not aware that the serpent has manipulated the woman and the man uh, into believing if they eat from the tree of the, uh, the knowledge of good and evil, they will not they will not die. And he's not aware that they've actually eaten the forbidden fruit. Amen. Now, picking up where we left off, therefore. It's important for us to notice what happens when the Lord God Almighty inquires with the man why he, the man, was hiding for God and who told the man that he was naked. Now, mind you, God poses specific questions to the man. There are two of them. Why are you hiding and who told you you were naked? Okay, those are the two questions. I'm trying to move my two fingers so that you can see them. Why are you hiding? Who told you you're naked? Okay. The man does not answer God directly. Okay. Let me let me help you understand what a direct answer to those questions are. Why are you hiding? Because I'm a naked. I'm naked and I'm ashamed. Who told you you're naked? Well, I learned that when I ate from the tree the fruit of the tree from the knowledge of good and evil, it made me aware that I was naked. And being naked made me feel ashamed. That's a direct answer to those questions. That's not what the man gives. The man turns and, and, it's, and, and what he does, he shifts the blame for his disobedience to the woman. He tells God, the woman you gave me, she gave me fruit from the tree and I ate it. That's not the question, the answer to the question he asked. 
He asks, why are you hiding? How did you know you were naked? His answer, the woman you gave me, she gave me fruit from the tree and I ate it. In other words, this is like, the, like when you were a kid, amen, and mama came in and said, who broke uh, the vase? And the first thing you holler out is, I told Johnny not to bring the house, the ball in the house, because that's against your rules. That's, that's not answering the question. What you did, you just ratted on the whole crew. Because what you did, you just told mama that the whole crew was in the house playing ball. When they were not supposed to be in the house at all. Um... Again, the man shifts blame for his obedient, disobedience to the woman. The woman you gave me, she gave me fruit from the tree and I ate it. Notice what happens when the Lord turned to the woman and asked her, what did she do? She did the same thing that the to the same thing that the man did. She shifted blame for her disobedience. To the serpent. She said, The serpent tricked me, and because I was tricked, I ate the forbidden fruit. Now, remember, we've been talking about this now for, for quite some time now. Uh, the truth is that the, the, both the woman and the man want to eat that fruit for quite some time. You know, the once, once you tell someone they cannot have something, cannot do it, that's the very thing we want to do because we want to see why it is that someone has told us we cannot have it, we cannot do it. Amen. The first time someone told you you could not have a certain food or a certain drink, that's all you want to have. That food and drink because you want to see what it what, what was so bad about this food and drink that you could not have. Same thing when God told them that you could not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil or the tree of life. That's what these two knuckleheads wanted to eat from the beginning. I, like I said before, I bet you they walked around, uh, uh, walked around uh, that those two trees every day, saying to themselves, "I bet that fruit tastes like X, Y, and Z. I bet that fruit is succulent. I bet that fruit is juicy. I bet that fruit tastes good. I bet that fruit wets your whistle. I bet that fruit does whatever. They wanted that fruit from the very beginning." But according to the woman, the only reason why she consumed the fruit is because the serpent tricked her, deceived her. And her, his deception made her consume fruit that she didn't want to consume. Come on. When's the last time you've been able to show up at the gym and tell your trainer that the reason why you so overweight and so big is because people at your house have tricked you and deceived you into eating desserts and all the wrong things and made you think you were eating the right. When the last time your trainer bought that? When the last time you told your bill collector that the reason why you don't have any money to pay the bill is because your friends tricked you and deceived you into going to Vegas and spending all your money thinking that you would have, you would come out of there a millionaire and you could pay off all When the last time your bill collector said, you know what, that sounds reasonable to me. I won't take any of your stuff right now. Not never. That's because that doesn't even, that doesn't even render or make sense. No one can trick you into doing something that you don't want to do. You did what you did because you want to do it. It just so happened that they said the right things to make you say to yourself, hmm, I think I want to do that. We, we've got to stop doing what the woman did when we get busted doing what we're doing. We've got to stop sitting here and putting the blame on everyone else and everything else for the action decisions and the actions we take. You didn't tell that lie because you were so afraid to hurt someone's feelings. You told that lie because you didn't want to be truthful. That you thought it was better to tell that lie than it was to tell the truth. Stop sitting here and saying you didn't want to tell someone the truth because you didn't hurt their feelings. You know what? This is what I found. Even though the truth hurts their feelings, it doesn't hurt them that much. 
In fact, if anything, the truth makes someone feel better about you because what they say is, at least I know he or she would tell me the truth. And because he or, tell me, he or she would tell me the truth, I wanted to put more trust in him or her. I wanted to spend more time with him or her. I mean, is it registering? We do the things we do because we want to do them. Not because someone manipulated us into doing them. You you went out and got tore down because not because your friends were getting tore down, because guess what? You want to get tore down. And it just so happened hanging with your friends allowed you to get tore down. Stop blaming your friends for getting tore down. We do what we want to do. And we can't be like the woman there in the Garden of Eden declaring that it was something else. A serpent tricked me and because I was tricked, I ate the fruit. As if she didn't know she was eating forbidden fruit when she put the, when she plucked the fruit off the tree. Like she didn't know she was eating forbidden fruit when she held that fruit in her hand and then took a chunk out of it, a bite out of it with her mouth. Like she didn't know that was forbidden fruit when she turned to her husband and gave him a piece so that he could eat it. She wasn't that tricked. She knew exactly what she was doing. But what we see here is the spirit of shifting the blame, shifting responsibilities for our own disobedience to someone or something else. N again, no one is willing to set responsibility. Now, here's the thing. We would think that with all this newly acquired knowledge that the man and the woman gained by eating uh, the forbidden fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that the knowledge they gained would help them understand that if there's anything God expected of, expects of his followers, it's for us to be man or woman enough to take responsibility for the actions we commit. If you read through the Bible, Every time God has to confront someone for some sin they committed, every time God has to chew someone out for uh, falling short, one of the biggest issues he takes with those persons is when he tries to confront them about it and they want to shift responsibility, shift blame to someone else. God, sometimes I wonder... If, many times, if we would just be honest and take responsibility, be accountable for our actions, how they would turn out. I wonder if God truly has a tender heart. And not that I'm questioning whether God's heart is tender. I know it is for the simple fact that you and I are still here today. Of course he has a tender heart, but I'm saying a tender heart as far as a parent goes when a parent needs to discipline a child. I wonder if we would just say to God, you know what, God, yes, I did do it. Yes, you did tell me not to do it. The reason why I did it is because I was just so tempted. I was so turned on by what it is you told me not to do or what it, who it is you told me not to interact with. And I just had to taste and see for myself. Now I realize why you told me not to do it. I know there's going to be a consequence. I know there's going to be a, response, a, a, a repercussion. But God, I want you to know that, yeah, I did it. And I didn't do it to, 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 to disrespect you. I did it because I just had to know for myself why it is that you don't want me to do it. I wonder how God responded. I wonder if God would say, you know what? If I was in your shoes, I probably would have done it too. I, w I just wonder how God would respond to us if we would just be honest and accountable and responsible for the decisions and the actions we commit and the decisions we make. I have a feeling that God seeing us take the responsibility for our disobedience would not have to go to the extent that he does in punishing us. That's not to say he wouldn't punish us at all. But to know why you did it. Especially if let's say the reason why you did something is because you thought that even though it was wrong, this was the lesser of all of the evils. God may say, I understand that. 
We've never been here. We've never dealt with something like that. I can understand how you believe doing what I told you was actually the lesser of all the evils. And so there was no, you, and you didn't have any way around this. And so you had to, I can see God saying that. But however, I cannot see him saying, yeah, that's right. You did it because they did it over there. You did it because they said it's all right. No. God, I'm not trying to hear all that. God wants us to be responsible. And here's the thing. If the man and the woman knew the difference between right and wrong, which they do now because of eating from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, then they had to know that the Lord our God demands responsibility and accountability from his people. In fact, that's why I think they're hiding. I think they're hiding because they realize at this point that God required, requires obedience. They also realize they've been disobedient. They, all, they further realize that the next thing he's going to require from them is responsibility for their misconduct, for their disobedience. And I believe that they're unwilling to give it. And, they, and for some reason, they believe that they can hide from God. In fact, I'm getting there because I really want to chew on that tonight. They believe that they can hide from the God we serve. Amen. Amen. And, and, and before I get to them about believing they can hide from God, I also believe they're fearful of the consequence that they're going to have to suffer as a result of their disobedience, and therefore they don't want to accept responsibility for their disobedience because they fear that accepting responsibility will hasten the punishment. If I can analogize this to when we were kids, this is like getting the note sent home to your parents. But before the note came home, the teacher picked up the phone and called your parents and said, I'm sending a note home because your child is doing X, Y, and Z. And the, from the moment you get off the bus to the moment you get home, that's the longest, most painful walk that you have to make. Because you are so afraid of what your parents may do to you. You have an idea what they're going to do. But you're so afraid of what they may do to you that guess what? It takes you forever to walk a block home. In fact, playing outside with your friends didn't feel fun anymore because you were too occupied with worrying about what they were going to do to you once they got their hands on that note. I know I did. I know I couldn't concentrate, couldn't focus. I was so afraid that my father was going to kill me when he saw the note from the teacher that, I mean, my, uh, my afternoon was ruined. I think that's where the man and the woman are at this particular junction, at this particular time. And that's one of the reasons why they're hiding from God. They don't want to feel, to, to, to deal with the consequences of their behavior. They don't want to deal with uh, the uh, uh, repercussions of their disobedience. Uh, amen. Um, so we're, we're at this point where I want to ask us this question. I want us to think about this. I was hoping and praying, amen, that, um, hoping that something doesn't fall in my office, it, does, it, fall, it doesn't break, amen. I, I want us to think about this, and since we're, for most part, most of us are on Facebook Live, you just can't say it back to me. You can type it in to me if you want to. But the question that God has for us is this. Who can hide from the presence of the Lord? Now, remember I told you that for the Yahweh's authors, they're not worried about God being omnipresent. That's not an issue for them. This set of authors that have, have written this creation story, they don't care about whether or not God is omnipresent. That's not important to them. They're only worried about whether, he, whether or not he's omnipotent. But in our Christian faith, we have pedagogicalized the Old Testament scripture. We have put a Christian slant, a Christian flavor on a, on a scripture that originally wasn't Christian at all. And so since we've tagged this Old Testament scripture with Christian flavor or the Christian slant, let's really take it there. We believe that God is omnipresent, that he's ever-present, that wherever we are, he's there. The question then becomes, who can hide from the presence 
of the Lord. And I want us to think about this. Because quite often, many times, um, excuse me, many times, we believe we can hide from the Lord. And not only can do we believe that we can hide, we also believe that uh, we can hide our actions from God. Okay? Um, amen. Um, the problem is, is that if we're going to believe that God is omnipresent, that he's ever present, then we must realize that there's nowhere we can go that the Lord isn't already there. In fact, King David reminds us about this in Psalm 139, when he says, I climbed to the highest mountain and there you were. I went into the, there, amen, brother Kevin, I went into the lowest valley and there you were. I swam down to the deepest depths of the sea, and there you were also. Where can I go where I can escape? You, There's nowhere you can go where you can escape the presence of God. God is always there. That also means that what we think we're trying to do, what we think we're hiding and doing out the eyesight of God, we're really doing it in his eyesight. Let me help you understand where I got where I got got that from. Okay, Amen. When we say the presence of God, the Aramaic word that our Bible editors are translating into presence doesn't actually mean presence at all. Rather, that word means face. So when the so. When we say who can hide from the presence, who can hide from the face of God? In fact, the, that word, let me give you that word. I know someone is saying, what is that word, Pastor Al? That word is the Aramaic word, paneum. Paneum, P-A-N-I-Y-M, paneum. It means face. So when the, Old, when the Old Testament authors are writing this and the Jews are reading this, the scrolls of this uh, book of, of, of the Jewish canon, they understand who can escape the face of God. Because again, if God is always around us, God is always with us, that means God is always watching us. And if he's always watching us, that means his face is turned to our face. There's never not a time that we're not facing him. How, who then can hide from the face of God? So let me mess with some folks. When you thought you were going to cheat on your wife or your, your husband and get you a little bit on the side, you got you a little bit on the side in the face of God. When you thought you were going to take that Esther Snicker bar or that Esther Reese's Pieces uh, candy packet and no one saw you at the store doing it, God did because you did it in his face. When you sat there and told that story, that bold, bald-faced lie and got away with it because the people bleed you, there's one person you didn't get away with it from because God was right there. You did it in his face. There's never any occasion, any incident where God, uh, where we have done something and it's been outside the presence of God. In fact, that brings me uh, 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 to this question. Uh, if we're always in the presence of God, how then are we that bold and big enough to sin before him? If we're always in the presence of God, what kind of boldness and authority do we think we operate in to actually commit a sin in his midst? If we realize that, I think many of the sins we commit, we wouldn't commit them anymore. Let's be for real. Not very many of, many of us were bold enough to disobey our parents in their face. I mean, you didn't disobey my father in his face. My father was crazy. My father laid hands on you. In fact, if uh, child, abuse law, child abuse laws were as tough then as they are now, my father would still be in jail right now. Okay? So no, you didn't, you didn't show out in front of my father. I wonder if we treated God like we treat that parent that we know we don't show out in front of. Would we sin the way we do? Will we hustle, scheme, cheat, steal, lie the way we do? 
will we covet and bear false witness the way we do if we knew we were literally in the face of God. If God acted and treated us like that parent that we knew not to show out in front of. Will we do it? I don't think we would. In our scripture here tonight, in the uh, 8 to 13 verses of Genesis chapter 3, the man and the woman aren't just hiding from God's presence. They're literally hiding from him. They're hiding from him. The, the, not only they're hiding from him, they're hiding from him because, as the man says, I'm afraid. Amen. He's afraid. What is he afraid of? He's afraid of the consequences that the Lord is going to impose for his disobedience. He's afraid. Now, I went and did a little research on what that Aramaic word is for being afraid of someone or something. And what I learned is that the word for being afraid of someone or something is the same word that is used to indicate this son, that we revere someone or something. That Aramaic word is yare, yare, y a r e with an accent over the e, accent mark over the e, yare. And if we are listening to what that what how that word sounds, yare sounds a lot like Yahweh. Yahweh, to be afraid of or to revere, sounds a whole lot like Yahweh, the name of God, one of the names of God. And it's interesting that uh, the word for fear is the same word for revere. This is why I think that the uh, psalm or the proverb that says the beginning of wisdom is fear of the Lord. I think the psalmist or the of the author of, the, of that proverb had both revering God and fearing being afraid of God in the same breath. It's one thing to revere God. It's one thing to respect Him, to hold Him in a position of awe. But if we're really going to be His followers, we got to fear the reprisals for being disobedient. And the psalmist or the author of the proverb wants us to know that wisdom True wisdom begins with fearing God, with revering Him and being afraid of God. Amen. The one who fears God and is afraid and, and reveres Him is the one that will go far in the eyesight of God. Amen. Um, again, Yare. Let me help you grasp this because I want you to understand this. Yare. Y a r e with the pot, with the accent mark over the e. It means to be held in awe of, to be astonished by, to inspire great reverence, inspire reverence or godly fear, and to honor and or respect. Amen. You know, it's funny, growing up, we used to say we feared our mama and daddy. We did. We were scared of them. But the truth is, many of us held our mothers and fathers in great respect we they we were in awe of them uh and we were uh we we really honored them because of who they are and what they mean to us amen um all right do 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 the next word i want us to look at uh because you got to remember when god asked why are you hiding who who told you you were naked the man's response to god was the woman you gave me, she gave me the fruit to eat and I eat it and I ate it. Now, this is a big thing. Uh, because I want us to understand what's happening here. Okay? First of all, the Aramaic word that's being used to indicate indicate that God gave the woman to man, and the woman gave the fruit to, to him to eat, is the word Nathan. Amen. Just like the name we have nowadays, N-A-T-H-A-N, Nathan, that's the word, the Aramaic word for to give. That's being used here in this in this situation. Amen. Uh, uh, 
the man uh, um, uses the same verb to express the actions of both the both God and the woman. Amen. Amen. We see this same word in use. We see its Greek version, uh, but the same principle. Um, in fact, no, I'll hold that. I'll hold that because I'm coming to it. I'm coming to it. Uh, God gave the woman to man. God Nathan the woman to man. God, the woman Nathan the forbidden fruit to the man. All right, so both of them gave. This leads us to the question, and this is a rhetorical question I want you to think about, but you can comment, chime in if you want to. Use the, use the, the box down at the bottom of the uh, uh, Facebook Live window. But this question I want you to consider, to consider is seeing that the man said, the woman you gave me, she turned around and gave me the forbidden fruit and I ate it. Could it be that the man is asserting that both God the Father and the woman held the same position of influence and importance to him? Could it be that the man, because he's asserting that God gave him the woman and the woman God gave him, turned around and gave him the forbidden fruit that he ate could the man be asserting that asserting that both the god and the woman god gave him hold the the position held god like authority over him now i asked that at noonday bible study and our people uh didn't necessarily think so um so then i had to rephrase the question i rephrased it like this was the woman as much a god to the man as the lord was did the man hold her in God-like status as much as he held God in God's status? That's the question for us. And the, and the answer is important because how we answer it also affects how we, how we deal with certain people that we hold in high esteem. Let's be for real. All of us have someone that we hold them to a God-like status. We know they're not God, but we give them so much power over our life. We give them so much influence over our life. We give them so much uh, uh, credence over our life that they then become God to us. And how we figure out how the man held the woman in, 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 in certain esteem will help us understand how we hold certain people in certain esteem in our lives. Amen. Um. When God gave the woman to men, God gave the man a divine gift. Please understand, anytime we see God give anything to any character within the Bible, God has given that person a divine gift. It's not anything out of the ordinary, it's not anything ordinary, it's not anything average. Anything that God gives a character, it is something special. It's something out of the ordinary. It's something unusual. And here's the thing. God gave woman to man, which means that the woman is something special. This is why you will hear me as a pastor declare all the time to the brothers that brothers, you got to treat your women better because you're, the woman that God gave you is special. She's unique. That God has crafted a certain woman for you that's going to help you meet every one of your needs, every one of your issues, and help you solve every problem you have. But the problem is we're treating our women as if they're just any old average ordinary thing. And I'm willing to bet you that for some of us, some of us ain't gonna get to heaven for the simple fact that we ain't treat the women that he's given us right. I tell all my married couples, in fact, I'm counseling a couple right now for premarital counsel and the one thing I told her husband to be is that that woman that God has given you yes you think you just asked this pretty girl to marry you but God actually made this day possible so that she could marry you that she is a gift you have a duty to present her back to him blemish free spot free wrinkle free uh, just as pretty and as anointed and as favored as she was the day God gave her to you you have that responsibility to, to care for her because she ain't anything. She's a gift from the Lord. Same thing with our babies. Here are we praying 
that God will bless us with babies. And when we get babies, we impatient with them. We treat them any kind of way. We act like they're a burden to us. No, those babies are gifts. And you should be treating those babies better than that. There's no reason why all of our kids aren't spoiled. Don't give me that crap about spare the rod, spoil the child. Y'all don't even know what that means. We think it means don't spank your child, they grow up spoiled. That's not what it means. Everything in Jewish culture had a measuring stick. Two rods were, 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 were connected. And depending on what the offense was, depending on how high the rod was and how high the rod was, depending on how much you had to pay uh, as a penalty for violating that law. So when the psalmist or the proverbist says, spare the rod and spoil the child, what he's saying is if you don't teach your children responsibility, they'll never grow up responsible and they will be a burden to, your, to the community. That doesn't mean beat your kids half to death because guess what? You in the grocery store and they ask for candy. Yo, terrible parent. They children. They supposed to ask for candy. They supposed to ask for toys. You supposed to be a bigger person, bigger adult than your kids are children and be able to handle that and to move them away from that. That doesn't mean you show out and tear them up and abuse them in front of people. Yeah, I said it. And if anyone has a problem, you tell them, Pastor Al said it. These babies, these, your wives and wives, your husbands are gifts too. We have to respect and honor and value the gifts that the Lord our God gives us. Amen. But let's, let's also tag that information with this warning, okay? When we let other people, other people possess God-like authority in our lives, amen. Uh, okay, we are having a little problem. Amen. Amen. We're having a little problem. Okay, we're going to keep going. When we let people possess God-like authority in our lives, we will always find ourselves being disobedient to the Lord, our God. Amen. When we let other people possess God-like authority, we always find ourselves being disobedient to God. Jesus says it, and he says it matter-of-factly. He says that no person can serve two masters. You will love one master and despise the other. Or you despise the first master and love the second one. You can't love two masters. You can't love God and something else. This They both can't be your masters. One has to be less than the other. And unfortunately, the problem becomes for many of us that... We have chosen everything else but God to be our masters. We've chosen our wives and our husbands to be our masters. We've chosen our children to be our masters. We've chosen our best friends. We've chosen our pastors. We've chosen our uh, the people that we want to most influence. We've chosen them to be our masters. And in the process of choosing them, to be our masters, what occurs is these people end up leading us away from where we want to be. They end up leading us away from God. They end up leading us away from that which God has called us to do. They end up leading us away from the task He's put before us. They end up leading us away from uh, the uh, from the uh, uh, the obligations that he has called upon us uh, to fulfill, they lead us away. And what we have to do uh, uh, is uh, choose God, choose to serve God, choose to follow God, choose to. Um, 
uh, choose to uh, be obedient to God and not to these other people and other things. Now, I know that's hard. I know it's hard. I know it's hard as the day is long. Because guess what? No one wants to be on the outs with the people around us. No one wants to be the eye man out. No one wants to be thought of less than what they, what they feel they should be. But here's the thing. God sometimes has to come first. And when, when, he come, when he comes first, and to make him first, that means someone has to be second, third, or not at all. The question is, can we accept God's will and let other people go so that we can have all of him? That's the question. And the truth is, many times... God puts that before us. When when the issue becomes, are we going to serve him or are we going to follow other people? And the reason why this issue keeps coming up, let me tell you. It keeps coming up because we keep choosing to follow other people rather than God. And not only does it keep coming up, but we keep getting our hearts broken. We keep being disappointed. We keep being upset because we continue to choose everything else but God. I know. When we look at God versus whatever the world is offering, offering us, God isn't as sexy as the world is. That God's way doesn't seem to be as fun as the world's way is. That God's way doesn't seem to be exciting and thrilling and, and just uh, be on your tiptoes living as uh, the world's way is. What we fail to realize is God's way sure leads us and ensures that we will have life. The, world way, the world's way takes us to a quick death. Yeah, you're going to be excited. Yeah, you're going to be thrilled. But in, in the end, you're going to be dead. And God, rather you be alive. And here's the thing, for anyone who's really gotten to know God, we know that God is such an awesome God that once you get come into the fullness of God, you realize there's more fullness in God, there's more excitement and thrill in God than there's not. That you realize what the world offered you was an empty pipe dream, was a fantasy, but with God, it's the real thing. But the problem is, too many of us sacrifice what God has for us, what God wants to give us, because we have put someone else on a God level. We've made them our God. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about, because y'all don't believe me. Amen. Praise God. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going there tonight. Amen. Um, I remember there was this young lady. She had come to us and she had prayed that the church would stand behind her for this educational opportunity. She, Our prayer was that God would not only open the opportunity up for her, but open it up for her so that she would not have to pay a thing. That all she had to do was go take advantage of the opportunity and be who God called her to be. So we pray. We're praying uh, vigorously and, and fervently for her. We're making sure we're keeping her on the uh, prayer on the on the altar as we go to God in prayer. Amen. Uh, uh, her husband was uh, praying with us, and so what happened? God blesses her with the opportunity. The educational opportunity opens up; it becomes available to her. We are made aware that's coming available to her, and we share with her that the opportunity has been made available to you. Guess what she says to us in return? Well, I need to go home and ask my husband if my husband believes it's all right for me to take this, take advantage of this opportunity, to take to to to, to jump into this opportunity. Little did we know that while we were praying, her and her husband, their relationship was dwindling down. It was deteriorating. It was crumbling. So by the time the educational opportunity came around, their marriage was basically gone. And what the husband did to be vindictive against the wife is that when she came and told him about the opportunity, he told her not to take it. Even though he was one to ones praying for us, praying with us, 
that she gets the opportunity. He told her not to take it. And guess what she did? She did not take it. Y'all, I lost my sanity. I lost my faith and my Christianity in that moment because I let her have it. I'm like, what do you mean you're not going to take advantage of this opportunity because your, your man, your husband is not God? How are you going to pray to God? How are you going to ask us to pray to God that God opened up the windows of heavens, the doors of heavens, the gates of heaven to give you this opportunity? And then when you get it, you're going to listen to a human being tell you not to take advantage of it? I mean, I had to go and pray to God for forgiveness because that thing got me right there in my shuspah or whatever the Jewish people call it, my shuspah. It got me right there. She lost that opportunity. School paid for, books paid for, all she had to do was go to class. She lost it. Now God being the awesome God that he is, God brought the opportunity back to her again. And again, we pray that she would get it. But this time we pray God's will be done. So God create, opened the door, created the opportunity, but this time she had to pay for it. Amen, Brother Kevin. We've all been there. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. We've, we've all been there. She had to pay for it. She had to pay for every book, every, t every credit hour she took, every educational the need she had. She had to pay for it. And I believe that was because God said, this time, this is on you. And when this happened, some folks were upset. They're like, but we prayed. And I had to be like, God already provided our opportunity. The opportunity came and went. This is God saying, this time you got to do it. And my folks, uh, amen, uh, Sister Virginia, my folks didn't understand it, so I had to take them to the Word. And in the Word, when God gives, the, gives Moses the first ten commandments, all right, they're not just ten, there's 610. When he gave him the first ten commandments, the first time God said, Moses, come up here on the mountain. And I will give you the, ten, the commandments to take back to the people. So Moses went up on a mountain. God himself carved out the stones. God himself wrote the commandments on the stones. God did everything he gave them to Moses. You know what Moses did? Moses destroyed those tablets in a fit of rage against the people. When he comes back down off of Mount Sinai and sees the people worshiping the gold, golden idol, the golden calf. In his anger, he throws the uh, the the tablets at the calf, destroying the image they made. But in the process, he destroys the tablet. The law, the law is is broken. It, it literally is broken into pieces down to the ground. Well, God says to Moses a couple days later, "Come back up on the mountain. I want to give you the law again." So Moses starts off. He said, ah, 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 ah. "Wait a second. Before you come up the mountain, grab you two tablets. Cut out two tablets." And bring your chiseling tools with you. And so when Moses now has to carry two big heavy tablets along with a bag of chiseling tools with him up the side of the mountain. And when he gets up the side of the mountain, God says, I'm going to dictate the law to you and you're going to chisel it. In other words, I gave you what you needed the first time. But because of your own actions, you caused yourself to forfeit, to lose out on it. And now, if you want it, you've got to now do the work to get it. That's what happened with my member. That is what is getting ready to happen with the man and the woman in the Garden of Eden. Yes, we know their name is Adam and Eve, but they don't have names yet. This is what's getting ready to happen. They're about to be kicked out of the Garden of Eden to now have to live life in a way that they earn the life they live. Before God gave it to them. All they had to do was just be obedient. Don't eat from the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And they didn't have to worry about anything. The land would give them anything they wanted. They, there was no such thing as a winter or a fall. It was summer all the time. All they had to do was just be obedient. But since they could not be obedient, since the man put his wife at a God-like level, on a level that only God should occupy in his life, he now is forced to beat his brow, to break his back, to force the land, to give him what once the land would, give, given, would have given him freely. I wonder 
how many of us continue to forfeit the God-given gifts, the gifts that God gives us, where we don't have to do anything but walk in them, and instead mess those up, lose those, then have to fight to work our way back to what God has given us, only then have to work it so that now we have to make it respond to us instead of having just trusted God and stay where God wanted us to be and just experience his, the fullness of his goodness and grace. I know someone may be scratching their head by what I said because it was sin very long, so let me say it like this. How many times have we ha have we've lost out on opportunities where we all we had to do was simply walk in the grace of God? How many times have we had to fight our way back to that very place? But once we fought our way back, God says, I'm not going to do it for you this time. You're going to have to do it on your own. And how many times have we realized just how hard the opportunity is where it should not have to have been hard if we had just been faithful to God? Don't worry. I'll wait. I've been there. I, I'm telling you this is really the truth. I myself have been, I'm not afraid to admit to you my, my shortcomings. I've been there. I've screwed things up royally. Had to fight my way to get back to it. And now that I'm back, I'm having to fight to work through that thing. And you know what? That past experience of having to fight my way back to something that God gave me freely has taught me a lesson that the next time God blesses your little Ruta Tuta with the opportunity to just walk in his grace and mercy, Pastor Al, you better take it and you better maximize it and you better not let anyone talk you out of that. Someone ought to be over there saying, well, Pastor Al, I can take your name out and put my name in it and then preach just the same. We can't let another person, another human being, or even a thing occupy God-like status in our lives. We can't. Here's the thing that we must understand, and this is why we can't let it happen. These persons or things that we let occupy God-like status in our lives are called idols. And idols never want the same thing that our God wants. They never do. Idols only want what's good for them. God wants what's good for us and all those around us. When's the last time your idol said to you, you know what, don't pay me any attention, don't give me any special treatment, give it to the people around you. Don't worry, I'll wait. Your idol will never tell you that. Because the reason why your idol is your idol because it has all of your attention. Your idol will never forsake it, your attention for the well-being of others. But God will. God will say, if you love me as much as you say you love me, then love your neighbor. Love your brothers and sisters. Love Miss Johnson across the street. Love Mr. Williams down the block. Love that crazy old uh, person that works at the at the corner store. Love uh, that co-worker that, co that drives you up one side of the wall, across the ceiling, and down the other side of the wall. Love that supervisor that gets on your nerves from Monday morning to Friday evening. Love those people that are hard to love. That's what God says if you're going to love me. And please understand, he's not saying that, that he doesn't believe you don't love him. What he's saying is if you really want to, to show me this kind of love, then share that love with those around you. Share it with your neighbors. Your idols will never say that. Trust me, they won't. This means we must make a choice. Amen. Amen. Either we choose the Lord our God or we choose the desires of man. And by man, I mean woman too. Amen. Some of the greatest falls in the world have been by men who have put God-like authority and power in the hands of the women they're with. 
Now, yes, I did say just a few minutes ago that we have to celebrate and value the women that God gives us as the gifts they are. Yes, we do. But we never worship the gift. We always worship the gift giver. Because here's the thing. Because he's a gift giver, he's also the gift taker backer. That just as easy and quick as he does give us a gift, he can turn around and take that gift from us. Trust me, I know. There was a time I was seeing someone and I put them on a godlike status. In fact, I remember when she said to me, we ought to find a church. And I told her I didn't need to find a church because I thought she was all the God I needed. Hmm. Can you imagine hearing God? See how I'm moving back on that? I'm moving back for myself on that one. Can you imagine what the face of God made, the stinky face of God made when he heard me say that? Little did I know at that point she was on, on a process. God was about to, she was on her way out. Because what God says, God says, I shall have no, you, I will have no other gods but me. And you shall have no other gods but me. And so she had to go. God had to remove her. And boy, did he. I mean, he c cut that relationship off like a butcher taking a razor sharp cleaver and cutting a piece of meat. It was quick. It was unexpected. And it was heartbreaking. But I now understand. I now realize and learn that the reason why it was so heartbreaking was because my heart wasn't connected to the right one to begin with. Who among us has done the same thing? You've chosen a person over God. Don't worry. You don't have to admit it to me. You ain't got to admit it to any of these folks. But you and God know. And if you've chosen someone over God, I implore you, I beg you, I plead with you to go back and re redo that decision. To go back and recommit yourself to God. To give yourself back to God. To put that person back into a human status. A, hu a place of human status. And to take that person out of that godlike status. Because you're only doing yourself a favor. You're only helping yourself. The man we ain't got to the woman yet. The man lost access to the Garden of Eden. He lost access to immortality. He lost access, access to the resources of God. We had to do nothing to get them. He lost it all. He lost everything. Simply because he made or he put his wife in a position reserved solely for God. Mm. How many of us have suffered similar losses because we too have put persons in places reserved and meant for the Lord our God? Amen. Amen. Why don't we do this? Why don't we pause right there? Amen. We are give, we're going on almost an hour and ten minutes and that's about our time limit uh, with Bible study. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Again, we apologize to anyone that was watching the first live stream that got cut off. For some reason, the, the computer went, the computer's video streaming process went down. We had to restart the video streaming process. But if you watch the two live broadcasts together, you'll see uh, uh, the whole pre presentation. Don't worry. You're a couple of hours away from me putting the YouTube video up on the church's Facebook page because we're recording it right now. We're getting ready to upload it to YouTube. So don't worry. We're, we're on the verge of doing that. Uh, but we want to thank you for joining us tonight. We want to thank you for being part of Bible study tonight. And we invite you to come back and be part of Bible study with us next Wednesday. We'll be on both at 12 and 7. What, what, what we teach at 12 is what we teach at 7. So if you miss one, tune into the other one. We're not... We're keeping it at the same speed, at the same pace. pace. So, with that said, we, let's have our closing word of prayer. Uh, and then we're going to get busy enjoying this evening, this day that the Lord has made. So why don't you bow your head with me as we go to God in prayer. Dear Father God, creator of the heavens and the earth, God, we come to you right now. Thank you for this day, for this is the day, God, that you've made. 
We are glad. We are rejoicing in it. Father God, we thank you, God, for opening up your windows of heaven and pouring us out blessings we cannot contain. Too often, God, we think those blessings have to be something tangible, have to be money, have to be jewelry, have to be riches. But many times, the blessings that you give us is your knowledge. You make us aware of what your expectations and your requirements of us are. And God, knowing what's expected of us and what we're required to do is better than money because, God, that means we have a chance to be not only faithful to you, but be obedient to you. In fact, God, the truth is faithfulness begins with obedience. And God, if we just would do what you say, then God, you would count us faithful and deem us righteous. So, Father God, we thank you for sharing with us what it is that you want us to do and what it is that you don't want us to do. Father God, we pray that now you give us the strength, the ability, the authority, and power to walk in that knowledge, to be able to implement your expectations and your requirements in our individual and collective lives, that God, when we go out here to minister, God, that we would be disciples that are efficient, effective, and efficacious, that God, we would be disciples that declare your word with boldness and with faith, and we would be stewards that take this responsibility of ministry seriously, and take it and do something with it so that someone comes and know you, God, through the free pardons of their sins. Father God, we pray for each and every person who's battling the coronavirus, who has a coronavirus, or a family member that has a coronavirus. We pray for healing, God, complete restoration and wholeness. God, we pray for those persons who've lost their lives to the virus. God, we pray, God, that you would bless them with eternal life, that where God, they would not have to suffer will not have to hurt with God. They can uh, uh, move in the freedom and the fullness of your love, your grace and mercy. God, we pray for those of us who are trying our hardest not to catch the virus, trying to stay safe. God, we pray that you continue to help us stay safe, continue to help us to stay home, continue to help us to trust you during this time, and to know that, God, the more we trust you, the more likely we are to come out of this thing uh, without experiencing uh, the coronavirus ourselves. Now, Father God, be with us, even though we're going to leave this Bible study, be with us always. Let your presence go with us. Let it rest, rule, and abide in our lives. Continue to protect us, continue to keep us, and never leave us. It's in your Son's mighty, matchless, marvelous, and magnificent name that we do pray. Amen. Amen, everyone. Amen. Good night. It's been such a pleasure to facilitate this Bible, this this latest edition, this evening edition of Bible Study, and we pray that God will continue to richly bless you, all right? Please have a blessed night. Bye-bye now.